Chapter 22 Billy nodded. He was convinced. And he smiled. He stood up from the bench in the barbershop window and took Roscoe's hand. Shook it very formally. Good work, he said to her. A perfect analysis. I always said you were smart, Roscoe. All right, we should be. I tell you, she's the best we got. I nodded and smiled, and Roscoe blushed. Finley held onto her hand and kept on smiling. But I could see him combing backward and forward through her theory, looking for loose ends. He only found two. What about Hubble? Where'd they keep thinking of? They wouldn't recruit a bank executive just to load trucks, would they? I shook my head. Hubble used to be a currency manager, I said. He was there to get rid of the fake money. He was feeding it into the system. He knew where it could be slipped in. Where it was needed. Like his old job, but in reverse. He meant it. What about the air conditioners? Sherman Solert was hauling them to Florida. That woman told you. You know, that's for real. Because you saw two old cart tons in her garage. And his truck was full of them when the Jacksonville PD searched it. What was that all about? Legitimate business, I guess, I said. Like a decoil. It concealed the illegal part. That camouflage. It explained the truck movements up and down to Florida. They would have had to run South MP otherwise. Finley nodded. Smart move, I guess. No empty run. Makes sense. Sell a few air conditioners. It makes money both ways, why? He nodded again and let go of Roscoe's hand. We need samples of the money. I smiled at him. I had suddenly realized something. I've got samples, I said. I put my hand in my pocket and pulled out my thick roll of hundreds. Pulled one off the back of the roll and one off the front. Gave the tool bank notes to Finley. These are their counterfeits. Got to be, I said. Charlie Hubble gave me a wad of hundreds for expense money. She probably got them from Hubble. Then I took another wad from those guys who were out looking for me Tuesday. And that means they're counterfeit, why? Think about it, I said. Kleiner needs operating cash. Why should he use real money? I bet he paid Hubble in counterfeit money. And I bet he gave those Jacksonville boys counterfeit money for their operating expenses, too. Finley held the tool hundreds right up to the bright light in the window. Roscoe and I cried at him for a look. Are you sure? Roscoe said. They look real to me. They're fakes, I said. That to be. Stands to reason, White. Hundreds are what fakers like to print. Anything bigger is hard to pass. Anything smaller isn't worth the effort. And why should they spend real bucks when they've got truckloads of forgeries available? We took a good look at them. Heard at them, felt them, smelled them, rubbed them between our fingers. Philly opened up his billfold and pulled out a hundred of his own. He compared the three notes. Passed them back and forth. Couldn't see any difference at all. If these are fakes, they're damn good. Philly said. But what you said makes sense. Probably the whole of the Kleiner Foundation is funded with fakes. Millions every year. He put his own hundred back in his billfold. Slid the fakes into his pocket. I'm going back to the station house. You two come in tomorrow about noon. He'll will be gone for lunch. We'll take it from there. Roscoe and I drove 50 miles south to Macon. I wanted to keep on the move. It's a basic rule for safety. Keep moving her on. He shows an anonymous motel on the southeastern fringe. 
as far from our grave as you can get in Macon, with the city sprawled between us and our enemies. Old Mayor T. Ladd said, a motel in Macon would suit me. Tonight, he was right. We showered in cold water and fell into bed. Fell into restless sleep. The room was warm. We tossed her on fitfully most of the night. Gave it up and got up again with the dawn. Stood there yawning in the half-light. Thursday morning. Felt like we hadn't slept at all. We groped around and got dressed in the dark. Roscoe put her uniform on. I put my old things on. I figured I'd need to buy some new stuff soon. I do it with Kleiner's forgeries. What are we going to do? Roscoe said. I didn't answer. I was thinking about something else. Reach it, what are we going to do about all this? What did Gray do about it, I said. He hung himself. I thought some more. Did he, I asked her. There was a silence. Oh, God, you think there's some doubt about that? Maybe, I said. Think about it. Suppose he confronted one of them, suppose he was found poking around somewhere he shouldn't have been. You think it killed him? There was panic in her voice. Maybe, I said, again. I think they killed Joe and Stoller, and the Morrisons and Hubble and Molly Beth Gordon. I think they tried to kill you and me. If somebody is a threat, they kill him. That's how Kleiner operates. Roscoe was quiet for a while, thinking about her old collie. Great, the dour and patient detective. Twenty five years of meticulous work. A guy like that was a threat. A guy who took thirty tool patient days to cross check a suspicion was a threat. Roscoe looked up and nodded. He must have made a wrong move. I nodded gently at her. They lynched him. I said. Made it look like suicide. I can't believe it. Was there an autopsy? I asked her. Guess so. Then we'll check it out, I said. We'll have to speak to that doctor again. Down in Yellow Springs. But he'd have said, why? If he'd had doubts, wouldn't he have raised them at the time? He'd have raised them with Morrison, I said. Morrison would have ignored them. Because his people had caused them in the first place. We'll have to check it out for ourselves. Wasco shuddered. I was at his funeral. We were all there. Chief Morrison made a speech on the lawn outside the church. So did Mayor Steele. They said he was a fine officer. They said he was Margrave's finest. But they killed him. She said it with a lot of feeling. She'd like Margrave. Her family had toiled there for generations. She was rooted. She'd liked her job. Enjoyed the sense of contribution. But the community she served was rotten. It was dirty and corrupted. It wasn't a community. It was a swamp, wallowing in dirty money and blood. I sat and watched your world crumble. We drove north on the road between Micken and Margrave. Halfway home Roscoe hung a right, and we headed for Yellow Springs down a back road. Over toward the hospital. I was hungry. We hadn't eaten breakfast. Not the best day for revisiting the morgue. He swung into the hospital lot. Booked the speed bump slowly and nosed around to the back. Parked up a little way from the big metal roller door. We got out of the car. Stretched our legs on a roundabout rug to the office door. The sun was warming the day up. It would have been pleasant to stay outside. But we ducked in and went looking for the doctor. We found him in his shabby office. He was at his ship desk. Still looking tired. Still in a white coat. He looked up and nodded us in. Morning, folks. 
What can I do for you? We sat down on the same stools as Tuesday. I stayed away from the fax machine. I let Roska do the talking. Better that way. I had no official standing. February this year. Bank chief of detectives said that the Margrave PD killed himself. Do you remember? Was that some guy called Grit? The doctor said. Hoska nodded, and the doctor got up and walked around to a file cabinet. Hold open the drawer. It was tight and made a screeching sound. The doctor ran his fingers backward over the files. February. Work. He pulled a file and carried it back to his desk. Dropped it on his blotter. Sat back down heavily and opened it up. It was a thin file. Not much in it. Tore it. He said again. Yes, I remember this guy. Hung himself. Why, first time we had a Margaret case in 30 years. I was called up to his house. In the garage, wasn't it, from a rafter? That's right. Oscar said. She went quiet. So how can I help you? He doctor said. Anything wrong with it? The doctor looked at the file. Turned the page. Uh, hands himself, there's always something wrong with it. Anything specially wrong with it, I said. The doctor swung his tired gaze over from Roscoe to me. Suspicious. He was nearly smiling the same little smile he'd used on Tuesday. Was there anything suspicious about it? I asked him. He shook his head. Mo, well, suicide by hanging. Open and shut. He was on a kitchen stool in his garage. Made himself a noose, jumped off his stool. Everything was consistent. We got the background story from the local people up there. I couldn't see a problem. What was the background story? Roska asked him. He swung his gaze back to her. Glanced through the file. He was depressed. Had been for a while. The night it happened he was out drinking was his chief. Who was the Morrison guy we just had in here and the town mayor up there? Some guy called Till. The three of them were drowning their sorrows over some case Gray had screwed up on. He got falling down drunk and they had to help him home. They got him into his house and left him there. He must have felt bad. He made it to the garage and hung himself. That was the story. Oscar said. Morrison signed the statement. He was real upset. Felt he should have done more. You know, stayed with him or something. Did it sound right to you? I didn't know Gray at all. This facility deals with a dozen police departments. I'd never seen anybody from Margrave before then. Quiet story of a place, right? At least it used to be. But what happened with this guy is consistent with what usually happens. Drinking sets people off. Any physical evidence, I asked him. The doctor looked back in the file. Looked over at me. Corpse tank of whiskey. Some fresh bruising on the upper and lower arms. Consistent with him being walked home by two men while inebriated. I couldn't see a problem. Did he do a post-mortem? Roscoe asked him. The doctor shook his head. The meat. It was open and shut. We were very busy. Like I say, we have more to worry about down here than suicides over in Margrave. February, we had cases all over the place, up to our eyes. Your chief Morrison asked for minimum fuss. I think he sent us a note, said it was kind of sensitive. Didn't want Gray's family to know that the old guy had been blind drunk. Wanted to preserve some kind of dignity. It was okay with me. I couldn't see a problem, and we were very busy, so I released the body for cremation right away. 
Rasta and I sat looking at each other. The doctor stepped back to the cabinet and put the file away. Closed the drawer with a screech. Okay, folks, if you'll excuse me, I've got things to do. We nodded and thanked him for his time. Then we shuffled out of the cramped office. Got back out into the warm fall sunshine. Stood around blinking. We didn't speak. Roscoe was too upset. She just heard about her old friend getting murdered. I'm sorry, I said. A bullshit story from beginning to end. Gian just screwed up on a case. He never screwed up on any case. He wasn't especially depressed. And he didn't drink. Never that should drop. So he certainly wasn't falling down drunk. And he would never socialize with Morrison. Or the damn mayor. He just wouldn't. He didn't like them. Never in a million years would he spend a social evening with them. And he had no family. So all that stuff about his family and sensitivity and dignity is total bullshit. I killed him and bullshit at the corner so he wouldn't look too closely. I sat there in the car and let the rage pour out of her. Then she was quiet and still. She was figuring out how they'd done it. Do you think it was Morrison and Teal? And somebody else, I said. There were three guys involved. I figured the three of them went around to his place and knocked on the door. Bray opened up and Teal pulled a gun. Morrison and the third guy grabbed him and held him by the arms. That explains the boozing. Teal maybe pour a bottle of whiskey down his throat, or at least splash two all over his clothes. They hustled him off to the garage and strung him up. Roscoe started the car and eased it out of the hospital lot. She drove slowly over the speed bumps. Then she swung the wheel and blasted up the road through the countryside toward Margrave. They killed him. Just a simple statement. Like they killed Joe. I think I know how you must be feeling. I nodded. They'll pay for it, I said. For both of them. You bet your ass. You fell silent. Sped north for a while, then merged with the county road. A straight twelve miles up to Margrave. Poor old Bray. I can't believe it. He was so smart, so cautious. Not smart enough, I said. Or cautious enough. You've got to remember that. You know the rules, White. Thought be on your own. If you see somebody coming, run like hell. Or shoot the bastard. Stick with Finley if you can, okay? She was concentrating on driving. She was doing a hell of a speed up the straight road. Thinking about Finley. Finley. She repeated. You know what I can't figure. But, I said. There's the two of them, why? Phil and Morrison. They run the town for Kleiner. They run the police department. Between them, they run everything. Their chief of detectives is Gray. An old guy, the wise head, smart and stubborn. He's been there for 25 years, since well before any of this shit started up. They inherited him and they can get rid of him. So sure enough, one day their smart and stubborn detective sniffs them out. He's found out that something is going on. And they find out that he's found out. So they put him out of the way. They murder him to keep it all safe, then what do they do next? Go oh, on, I said. They hire a replacement. Finley down from Boston. A guy who was even smarter and even more stubborn than Gray was. Why the hell would they do that? If Gray was a danger to them, then Finley would be twice as dangerous. So why did they do that? Why did they hire somebody even smarter than the last guy? That's easy, I said. They thought Finley was really dumb. 
dumb. How the hell could they think that? So I told her the story Finley had told me on Monday. Over donuts at the convenience store counter. About his divorce. About his mental state at the time. What had he said? He was a basket case, an idiot. Couldn't string two words together. Chief Morrison and Mayor Keel interviewed him, I told her. He thought it was the worst job application in history. He thought he had come across as an idiot. He was totally amazed they gave him the job. Nah, I understand why they did. They really were looking for an idiot. Roscoe laughed. That made me feel better. But that's ironic. They must have sat down and planned it out. Ray was a problem, they said. Better replace him with a fool, they said. Better pick the worst candidate who applies, they said. Right, I said. And they did. They picked a shell-shocked idiot from Boston. But by the time he turns up to start work, he's calmed down and turned back into the cool and intelligent guy he always was. She smiled about that for two miles. Then we crested a slight rise and began the long sweep down into Margrave. We were tensed up. It was like entering the battle zone. We'd been out of it for a while. Sweeping back into it didn't feel good. I had expected to feel better when I had identified the opposing players. But it wasn't what I had expected. It wasn't me against them, played out against a neutral background. The background wasn't neutral. The background was the opposition. The whole town was in it. The whole place was bought and paid for. Nobody would be neutral. We were barreling down the Raz at 70 miles an hour toward a dangerous mess. More dangerous than I had expected. Roscoe slowed up at the town limit. The big Chevy glided onto Margrave's glassy blacktop. The magnolia and dogwa, scrubbed to the left and right, was replaced by velvet lawns and ornamental cherries. Those trees with smooth, shiny trunks. Like the bark was buffed by hand. In Margrave, it probably was. The Kleiner Foundation was probably paying somebody a handsome salary to do it. We passed the neat blocks of stores, all of them empty and complacent, floating on an unearned thousand a week. We jinked around the village green with the statue of Casper Keel. Wafted past the turn down to Roscoe's house with its smashed front door. Past the convenience store. Past the benches under the smart awnings. Past the parkland where the bars and rooming houses had been, back when Margrave was honest. Then up to the station house. We pulled off into the lot and parked up. Charlie Hubble's Bentley was still there where I'd left it. Roscoe killed the motor and we sat for a minute. They didn't want to get out. We squeezed hands. Her right, my left. A brief good luck gesture. We got out of the car. Into battle. The station house was cool and deserted except for Baker at his desk and Finley on his way out of the Rosewood, the office and back. He saw us and hurried over. Kill's back in ten minutes. And we got a slight problem. He hustled us back to the office. We went in and he shut the door. It's hard, Paul. So it's the problem, I said. It's the safe house where Charlie and the kids are hiding out. That situation has to stay unofficial, why? He told me that, I said. He's out on a limb up there. Exactly. That's the problem. He can't staff it. He needs somebody to be up there with Charlie. He's been doing duty himself. But he can't do any more. Can't take any more time out. And he feels it's not appropriate, you know, Charlie being a woman and the little girl and all kids terrified of him. He looked over at Roscoe. She saw where the conversation was going. He wants me up there. 
Thus for 24 hours. Philly said. That's what he's asking for. Will you do it for him? Roscoe shrugged, smiled. Of course I will. No problem. I can spare a day. As long as you promise to get me back when the fun starts, we'll pay. That's automatic. Philly said. Fun can't start until we've got the detail. And as soon as we've got the detail, Picard goes official and he puts his own agents into the safe house. You come back here. Oh, hey. When do I go? I know. He'll be here any minute. She grinned at him. So you already figured I'd agree to it. He grinned back at her. Like I told we should. You're the best we got. She and I went back through the squad room and out through the glass doors. Roscoe took her vias out of the Chevy and set it on the curb. See you tomorrow, I guess. You going to be okay, I asked her. Sure, I'm going to be fine. Can't get much safer than an FDA safe house. Why, that I'm going to miss you, Risha. I didn't figure to spend time apart just yet. I squeezed her hand. She kissed me on the cheek. Just stretch up for a quick peck. Finley pushed the station house door open. I heard the suck of the rubber seal. He stuck his head out and called over to Roscoe. You better give Picard an update, okay? Roscoe nodded to him. Then we stood waiting in the sun. Didn't have to wait long. Picard's blue sedan squealed into the lot within a couple of minutes. Bastua stopped right next to us. The big guy folded himself out of the seat and stood up. Just about blotted out the sun. I appreciate this, Roscoe. He said, kill her. You're really helping me out. No problem. You're helping us out, Why? Where is this place I'm going? Picard grinned a harassed grin. Nodded toward me. I can't say where it is. He told her. Not in front of civilians, boy. I'm way out of line already. And I'm going to have to ask you not to tell him afterward, okay? And Rishi, don't you press her about it, or Charlie, okay? Okay, I said. I wouldn't press her about it. She'd tell me anyway. The guard said. He nodded a busy goodbye and picked up Roscoe's bag. Threw it onto his rear seat. Then the two of them got into the blue sedan and drove off. Those out of the lot and headed north. I waved after them. Then the car was lost to sight.